Hello, I'm Keith Denby and I'm a humanist. Although humanists don't believe that there are any gods or anything supernatural, we do believe that humans can live good lives by understanding how others feel, by asking questions and by trying to be kind, and to reduce harm by the way we treat other people, other animals and our environment. For humanists, the events of the Holocaust are heartbreakingly awful and they stand against everything we believe in. But we are aware that those cruelties could be repeated. The risk of genocide is always present when people treat others as inferior, as lesser beings rather than as equals. We need to see that the steps to genocide are there in front of us and that we can easily walk that way when we dismiss the right of others to live the same life as us. The coastal town of Ilfracombe is a quiet place with a working harbour facing out onto the Bristol Channel. Nowadays it's a holiday destination, but during the dark days of 1940, early in the Second World War, it was home to a large number of Jewish refugees who had escaped the Holocaust that was beginning to ravage the Nazi world. Their story is one of bravery and hope, but also of joy and creativity. In that time, the people of North Devon did, for the most part, treat these strangers as equals and as brothers and sisters, and help them to have a rewarding life in exile from their homes. The story of the Jews of North Devon has faded from memory, and that is a shame. The story should be remembered and celebrated as a small beacon of light in the terrible night of the Holocaust. Here is Helen Fry to tell that story. North Devon has an incredible history that's linked to the Holocaust in the Second World War. And it's a story that you may well not have heard of, but several thousand, in fact, over 3,000 German and Austrian Jewish refugees found refuge in North Devon during the war. They had had to flee Nazi Germany and occupied Austria, and some came from Czechoslovakia as well. It was incredibly difficult to get out of Europe. And as Jews, they were at risk because Hitler was within two or three years of the outbreak of war to decree his final solution for the annihilation of Europe's Jews, to wipe out the Jewish community. And those that were lucky enough to come to England in 1939 and just before had been sponsored by families over here. And many of them were living around Britain, but everything changed when war broke out on the 3rd of September 1939. And many of the men who had come over here, some of them had had their education disrupted because they were no longer allowed to be educated in Nazi Germany because they were Jews. And others were working in professions as doctors and lawyers and dentists and businessmen. They could no longer work in Austria and Germany. When they came to Britain, life was very difficult for them. But when war broke out, they wanted to fight they wanted to fight for Britain and on the side of the Allies because Britain had saved their lives. But it wasn't that straightforward because technically they were what was known as enemy aliens. It's a terrible term, but it basically means that once Britain had declared war on Nazi Germany, the German Jewish refugees living here in Britain immediately became sort of enemy nationality. But of course, they weren't our enemies. They had fled Nazi Germany. And by the end of 1939, the British government allowed German Jewish refugees to enlist, to sign up for the British forces. But there was only one unit at that point that the British government would allow them to join. And that is something called the Pioneer Corps. And the Pioneer Corps was basically a labour unit, building coastal defences, constructing camps, um, forestry work, guarding docks, all that kind of thing. But they weren't really fighting proper. But several thousand German Jewish refugees nevertheless enlisted in the British Army in the early part of 1940. And when Hitler overran much of Western Europe, so we're talking about when Hitler marched his forces into Holland, 
Belgium, into Denmark and Norway, of course, those two countries were occupied first, Denmark and Norway. And then into France, there was a real risk that Britain would be invaded by Hitler and his forces. And many of the German Jewish refugees who were training in the British Army had been training on a coastal town of Sandwich in Kent. And they were moved overnight to North Devon. They continued their training in Ilfracombe. Some of them actually trained for a short time in Biddeford, but the majority of them trained in Ilfracombe. And the British Army took over some of the hotels known as requisitioning. So they took over the hotels and some of the local holiday camps uh, in and around North Devon so that these refugees in British Army uniform could train. They had to be away from the south coast of Devon just in case German forces landed and some of German spies might walk amongst the genuine refugees, the Jewish refugees, and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So the men that were training in the army were moved from Sandwich in Kent up to North Devon to the seaside town of Ilfracombe. And it's an incredible part of Ilfracombe's history. And one of the other things that happened for those men who hadn't yet joined up the British army in May, June 1940, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill coined the phrase, collar the lot. And around 30,000 refugees found themselves behind barbed wire, called internment, on camps in the Isle of Man, uh, in the little island, uh, not far off the port of Liverpool. And there was an outrage in Parliament over that summer that these Jewish refugees had been interned. It was a security measure. But one of the ways they could get out over the summer of 1914 into September 1940 was to enlist in the British forces. And that's what they did. And once they'd signed up to serve in the British Army, they were still only allowed in the Pioneer Corps. And with their papers... And they had signed allegiance to the king. Then it was King George VI. They swore to be loyal to George VI and his successors forever. And they joined the British Army and as a sign of their loyalty, they were given the king's shilling. They were given their army uniform and they were posted to Ilfracombe where they joined the other soldiers, the other refugee soldiers who were training there. And Ilfracombe for the next couple of years became an amazing place of culture because what those refugees brought with them, and if you remember what I said just now, that many of them were also doctors, lawyers, dentists, businessmen, artists, some had played in the orchestras in Vienna and Berlin. They now found themselves in British Army uniform, marching up and down Ilfracombe seafront, practising for their army duties. And I was lucky enough to interview some of them before they passed away a few years ago. And one thing struck me they were not yet British. They didn't get their papers to say that they could be British citizens until after the war. But there they were in Ilfracombe, serving for the country that had saved them. Not yet British, but they all felt loyal. And they said that even though they didn't have the pieces of paper to say that they were British, they felt British. And that's really interesting in terms of identity that already they felt that they were part of us. And not only that, I did find it extraordinary that many of them said to me they were never going to go back to Germany or Austria or Czechoslovakia. They knew that once they had left behind the, the home of their birth and in, in the vast majority of cases they left their families behind, and they were often the only ones of their family that could get out. It was incredibly difficult to get out, particularly once the borders had closed 
with the outbreak of war. So it was difficult for them because, of course, they were getting news of the concentration camps and of the Holocaust. They worried about their families, their parents, their grandparents that were left behind in Nazi Germany. But they never thought twice about serving Britain and in the British army. And they enjoyed their time in Ilfracum, actually. They felt safe. The local people welcomed them. Initially, they were a little bit cautious of them, the local population. They were a bit concerned because they were really from Germany and we were at war with Germany. But once they understood that these soldiers had fled Nazi Germany, they were welcomed locally. They brought with them, as I said, their culture, their education. And in some cases where the younger men... 17, 18, 19, had had their education disrupted, had to cease to be educated in, in Germany and Austria, the older soldiers, uh, refugee soldiers, would teach them. And so what you find happens in Ilfracum, in some of those hotels, they set up like a mini university. You also have a, an orchestra that's formed and you get some of the finest music. And they start to contribute locally as well while they're training in Ilfracombe. And the training could be several weeks at a time. And all the while, there are more men who've enlisted, more German Jewish refugees. And they're coming through Ilfracombe for the next, as I said, couple of years until towards the end of 1941. And they set up a mini university and they're learning mathematics and arts and music and they're learning English. And if you think that there they find themselves in uniform, they have to very quickly learn the English language. They've still got their thick German accents, but they have to learn English very quickly. They have to learn how to survive. But what's incredible about the men that I interviewed and the would-be ultimately 10,000 German Jews, including some women, about a thousand women, who would serve Britain in the British forces. All, as I said, terribly proud of what they'd done for Britain. But ultimately, they wanted to fight. They wanted to join fighting forces because, again, they said to me, this was our war. We didn't want the British fighting it for us. We wanted to help the British to fight. And gradually, from the days in Ilfracombe, they were sent around the country on war work. As I said earlier, the forestry work, building coastal defences, defending the ports, unloading shipping supplies from the docks, but they wanted a fight. And their chance came in the middle of 1943. And this is where many of the men I interviewed transferred to fighting units. They became tank drivers. Some of them were in the parachute regiment and they were parachuted in ahead of very secret operations in September 1944. Many of them were involved in the D-Day landings. They were prepared to risk their lives. Some of them became commandos doing highly dangerous operations behind enemy lines and some were parachuted in as agents. So you see from this very initial story of their life in Ilfracombe, they start to make a bigger difference to the war. And some of them did lose their lives in action fighting with the British forces, for the British forces. It was an incredible sacrifice. But they were proud of what they'd done. And some of the other men were involved in secret work here. You've heard of places like Bletchley Park where they broke the Enigma codes. There were a whole team of secret listeners who would listen into prisons conversations to gain intelligence and secrets and they stayed in this country but their work here on the home front was as significant. And then of course at the end of the war and those who'd survived on the front line, those that had originally trained in and around Ilfracombe, were not demobbed 
from the British Army, they had one last task to form, perform for the Allies. And many of them were sent to post-war Germany or into Austria. And they began a process known as denazification of trying to strip the country of its Nazi ideology and its roots. And they had to set up a military government and restore democracy. And these men went on to help the Allies because they had a fluency in German, they could speak German. They were often sent back to the places where they were born and they knew them like the back of their hand. Although these cities were heavily bombed, sometimes as in Berlin, 90% destroyed, but they were sent back to help the Allies to restore democracy and freedom to Europe. But of course, they also learned the painful truth that whilst they had helped Europe to be free again, the vast majority of them had lost their families in the concentration camps. And there was this enormous sense of grief at the end of the war. And what it meant was that these men did not want to talk about their experiences. And so when I came to their story in around 2005, they weren't really wanting to talk. They had for about 60, nearly 70 years, built up a wall, a protective sort of invisible wall around themselves to shelter them from the emotion of what had happened to them. And what I found was there were three layers of trauma. The first shock and trauma was from losing the land that they'd been born in. They could not live. They'd been thrown out, effectively, of the land where they had been born. They'd lost, in a sense, their identity. They'd had to find a new identity. Then some of them had lost comrades on the battlefields, sometimes fellow refugees, but sometimes British comrades. They were like a brotherhood. They became very close to the other men that they fought with on the front line. So they've got the trauma of seeing lots of dead bodies in battle and fierce battles all the way into Germany, when, when we could go into Germany in 19, end of 1944, into 1945. And then at the end of the war, there's a the trauma of losing their families and their loved ones. Many of the men I spoke to actually went into Belsen concentration camp after the British had liberated it and carried out some humanitarian work before their regiments and their units moved on for the, for the work of restoring democracy to, to uh, Europe, to post-war Germany. So their legacy goes way beyond just thinking about their time in Ilfracum. And I came to this story not because I'm Jewish, but because I've always been fascinated in Jewish history. And I was born in North Devon. I was born in Ilfracombe, actually. I didn't live there for very long. I basically grew up in Barnstable. But I guess the story was bound to find its way to me in a kind of strange sort of way. And their legacy has largely been forgotten they made an absolutely necessary contribution to whatever fighting forces they were with. But Ilfracombe also had some other refugees there, some of the refugee women. Some of them were serving in the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service, otherwise known as the ATS. They would go on also, in many cases, to do some top secret work. But there were also youngsters from Nazi Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia, refugees who made it out, who were given shelter in a hostel, converted house in Braunton and another place by Down House, not far from Swinbridge. And these places were places of sanctuary for them. But they'd come out as a group with a vision to work the land, to learn skills, because they were too young 
to have finished their education. And in North Devon, where they're li whether they're living near Braunton or out near Swinbridge, they began to learn skills because ultimately it was hoped that they would make it on a visa, on special papers to Palestine, of course, what later became the State of Israel, and that they would settle and have a new life. And many of them did, after the war, travel to Palestine before it became Israel and worked on some of the kibbutz, which are sort of like camps, I suppose, farming camps, for want of a better word. So North Devon then played an absolutely crucial part, a defining moment in the memories of these refugees at a time of great trauma and I interviewed many of them for my book on Jews in North Devon in the wartime and whether they were now adults who had been youngsters in North Devon in the war or whether they were refugee soldiers they all remember their time in North Devon as being a happy one. There was you know, chance for them to practice religious observance if they were religious Jews. But interestingly, the vast majority of them that settled in North Devon for a short time were not necessarily religious. They were Jewish by birth, if you like, by race. And so even more astonishing, they found that they'd been thrown out of their country. And in some cases, some of them I interviewed hadn't known that they were Jewish, didn't know that they had a Jewish grandparent, for example, which put them at risk under Hitler's regime. They didn't know until Hitler came to power that they thought they were good, loyal Germans. And when they came to Britain, they lived in Ilfracombe and in North Devon. For that period, they felt safe in spite of the bombing of Hitler's bombing of Britain. And it remained a very special time in their memory. And I feel it's a very lucky thing to have recorded many of their experiences by hand and, and writing up in the book. I was very sensitive about not recording them because for many of them, they were telling their stories for the very first time and they had to face their past. But it was a very healing process. And many of them then went on to speak in documentaries and on television about their experiences. And this was something they could never have done until about 60 or 70 years had passed. So very special memories of North Devon in the war. And it would be wonderful to keep their memories alive to use some of the stories from my book to study, to, to take an individual and to follow their life story, to see what happened to them from their happy times in North Devon during the wartime. And before I finish, one secret I did discover, quite by chance, was that during the wartime, Ilfracombe had its own little synagogue. Who would believe it? And of course, the Jewish places of worship, you can, you can convert anywhere and, and say your prayers. So the Capstan Hotel, which is down there not far from the harbour, and there's a plaque there today, that was temporarily transformed into a synagogue during the wartime. And service personnel, these refugee soldiers, those that were religious, would come for services there. And then on the big occasions, like the Jewish High Holy Days, even those who weren't religious would attend services. And the Ilfracum Theatre, which could hold over a thousand, was an incredible sight of those Jews who'd been rescued from Europe being able to have their High Holy Days again. It's an incredible legacy and it's one that I hope will be reclaimed for North Devon's history. So when we think about the Holocaust and the horrors and the horrendous nature of what happened, we can distill those stories closer to home and study 
about some of those Jewish refugees who survived the Holocaust, who lived in and around and near us in North Devon. So please do take time to read some of their stories and to be inspired because they deserve to be remembered. Thank you.